Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic, balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring books, books, books. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas, so be sure to check out 1840.org, where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. So friends, it's the summertime, and I know this topic sounds so strange. It is not those big, heavy theological questions that we've become familiar with. It's not a heart-wrenching experiential drama. But for me, this is really the heart of Jewish ideas of, and Jewish exploration, and that is books, books, books. Uh, why do I say it three times? It probably originated from a conversation I remember my wife was having with her mother, and her mother is like a very great cook and was like going through like a recipe and the Tupperware needed. And I was like totally spaced out, like totally spaced out. And they called me in. They're like, Dove, did you get that last thing? And then I just looked at them. And I was like, bowls, 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 uh, bowls, 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 um, meaning I, I didn't get anything. I know bowls are involved uh, and I wasn't sure. Uh, but when I think of something that I love, I think books, books, books. So when I think of a topic that I'm excited about, I just go three times. Books, books, books. And that is what we're going to be exploring with our summer series. Uh, so much of what we do is really having conversations that are really lead to books. If you want to explore more, if you want to understand more, you really have to pick up the book and read it. And at the end of every single book, of course, is a conversation. When you finish a book, when you put it down, you want to then talk about it, discuss it. So I feel like so much of what we're doing and the ideas that we're exchanging on here, books are the link in that story. Now, obviously, we're conversation-driven. We are having podcasts, interviews, and that flows very differently than a book would. Books are written very sequentially. It has the beginning idea, the middle, and the end. The conversations are much more free-flowing. So I've always felt that they complement each other. And people who know the things that I share online – the things that really animate me is reading books. I'm absolutely obsessed with it, and I'm hoping that this series kicks off a new part, a segment of what 1840 uh, is all about, and that is book culture, book recommendations, book ideas, and you'll see a lot of that launching uh, this month, videos dropping, book recommendations, book lists, and I hope our readers reach out and share some of the books that animate them, that excite them, some of the books that really built their expertise. Like sometimes someone will ask you like, how did you learn so much about this? And like, it really boils down to maybe like two to five books that you can really develop an expertise. So we hope that we're able to hear from so many of our listeners of the favorite books that animate you, that you, de you develop your expertise with. And that's why I'm so excited to share this series of books, books, books with you this summer that hopefully will be extending throughout the year where we discuss all things books always and forever on 1840. I remember there was a article about the great political raconteur, Ben Shapiro. Uh, it was an article in Vanity Fair, which interested me a great deal, not because I care a great deal or I'm interested a great deal in politics. I am not a uh, politics. I have like an allergic reaction to political conversation, but it was an article in Vanity Fair about how he built his media empire, which actually does interest me. I'm always fascinated by how you build an empire that is driven by content and ideas, which he has been incredibly successful at. But that's not why the article was so fascinating. The article was so fascinating because of the image that was right behind Ben Shapiro. If you squinted and looked a little bit closely, you will notice that right behind Ben Shapiro were his Svarim shelf. And you can see in that picture a set of the Koran Talmud, the translated Rambam, a very clear picture of the art scroll set of Mishnayis. And I remember I shared this on Twitter and I wrote like the only thing I care about right now like is just squinting and trying to make out what are those Svarim, what are those books on his shelf. And this started like a momentary, I don't want to call it a craze, that's a bit much, uh, but a momentary fad 
on Twitter in particular where people were sharing specifically their not selfies, but shelfies, pictures of what was going on in the background. This was actually before COVID broke out and Zoom images of what were going on in people's offices. This was well before this. This was in December of 2018. And this trend began where people were sharing pictures of their shelves, what we affectionately called a shelfie, and we were literally like psychoanalyzing them. There was like shelfie analysis of like, explaining and exploring like what kind of person you are just based on what books are on your shelf. And I've always felt that your shelf is the way you fashion your own sense of self. And in fact, believe it or not, there is an academic article for anything and everything. And there was actually a conference after COVID-19 broke out about this phenomenon, about how people disclosed and showed their personality, their sense of self, based on what was on their shelves. And I and my dearest friend, Ellie Fisher, contributed to this conference with a presentation called The Jewish Bookshelf as a Site of Self-Fashioning, Reflections on a Historical Phenomenon in the Contemporary Moment, where we literally discussed how The things that you cite, the books that you include in your scholarship are really how you fashion your personality. What did Rav Yosef Cairo have on his bookshelf? What does he cite in his Shulchan Aruch within Beit Yosef? What does Rav Hutner quote in his Pachar Yitzchak? Rav Hutner, the great Rosh Yeshiva of Chaim Berlin, was very peculiar and specific about what he was willing to quote in his works and what he was even more importantly not willing to quote. The same is true of Reb Tzadok, the great Hasidic master who I constantly refer back to. Reb Tzadok was very influenced by Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. It was the focus of my master's thesis, but not once in all of his svarim does he in fact quote him. Who we quote, who we include on our shelves is always an indication of what kind of person we are trying to present ourselves to to the world. And I'm always suspicious of people who have like nothing on their shelves. Like sometimes I go to somebody's house and I look around and I'm like, what? This person has nothing to read. And during those long Shabbos meals, I think I've mentioned in the past, I will absolutely freak out. If you have nothing on your, like I've read the introduction to Kosher by Design, I think volumes one, two, and three. Uh, just If I can't find any, like I will read the phone book. I'm going to read the introduction to the cookbook. I will freak out. I need shelves that have personality. It doesn't have to be Jewish history. It doesn't have to be Jewish, but I need shelves that have personality if we're going to be friends. So I'm always interested in looking at people's shelves. And I think all of the different publishers, all the different types of books have their own personalities. And that's why I wanted to begin our exploration of Jewish books by speaking to who, in my opinion, are the three great pillars of Jewish publishing. Now, of course, this is not to exclude so many of the other great publishers of Jewish books. Lord knows if you look at this list, I have not published by any of them. I have been rejected by all three of them. God bless them. I've been rejected by all three of them. I'll tell you in in a little bit how and why. But the three pillars of Jewish publishing, in my mind, and again, write in those letters, tell me why I'm wrong, but the three pillars, in my opinion, are Art Scroll, Shockin' Books, and number three, Koran Publishers. And we, in this episode, are speaking to the heads of all three of these major publishers who I am privileged to have a relationship with all three of these major publishers when did they reject? Well, each of them have rejected me. Uh, uh, Alti, who is my cousin, who cousin by marriage, fake cousin with air quotes. Um, I always send her my writing. My writing is, is a little too either academic or too much Narishkite for Alti. I would never, ever blame her. I almost don't even ask her anymore. I just said, where would this work? I know it's not for you. Um, and she's always incredibly kind, incredibly gracious. Uh, Art Scroll was kind enough. I begged, I pleaded, I wanted so badly for them to publish my top five, the book that I eventually published with. Israel Bookshop Publications, and I begged Article. I said, please, you guys are the best. Please publish this. And they looked at me um, and snorted uh, with laughter. Top five, a list of Jewish character and characters. It was a collection 
of my articles for Mishpacha magazine, really top shelf Narjkite, if I may say so, uh, and Art Scroll was not interested, though I my objection is noted for the record. I do think Art Scroll should be publishing more humor, more comedy. Why not? Why not Art Scroll publish comedy? They publish cookbooks, they publish stories. Why not publish comedy? Uh, and maybe my next comedy book, which I am not working on, nor do I have any plans to do, but maybe we ever republish this Art Scroll, uh, will come back and say, you know what? We did Schottenstein, we did the Talmud, we did the Ramban, we translated so much. The next frontier is the comedy writings of David Beshevkin. I hope one day to get that email. I don't expect it anytime soon. And finally, Koren Publishers, uh, who uh, I also have a very close relationship with, uh, re- didn't reject. They just weren't that excited when I sent them uh, my book, Synagogue, Sin and Failure in Jewish Thought. They weren't chomping at the bits, uh, to put it lightly, uh, but I have no doubt that the time will come where we will be working and publishing together. And it's really my privilege today to speak with the heads of each of these major, major publishers to talk about the personality. What do these publishers represent? What kind of books do they publish? What are the ins and outs of how they got started? And that is why I am excited, first and foremost, to start with Art Scroll. Now, my relationship with Art Scroll is quite deep and quite serious. We published together this past year the NCSY collection of Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan's writings. Uh, we republished them. Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan, who is a great genius of Jewish thought, uh, who died in the early 1980s at too young an age. Uh, he was hired by Rabbi Pinchel Stolper, who also recently passed away, to share and kind of create a library of essential classics for NCSY. And Rabbi Ari Kaplan, who was a genius of geniuses, did exactly that. Uh, probably his most famous work was If You Were God, uh, Really a phenomenal book. I remember when it was first introduced to me by my counselor on NCSY Kolo, Rabbi Yehuda Balsam, who was a madrich at the time. He is now a rabbi in DRS. I remember he handed me the copy, looked at me and says, what do you mean is? Uh, he said with his classic dry sense of humor, if you were God, uh, really a phenomenal book. And he also wrote books on tefillin, on the Principles of Maimonides, what's known as the Yud Gimel Ikarim. He wrote a absolute classic on mikvah, on uh, the ritual bath that people immerse in called Waters of Eden. And we republished them as a beautiful set, uh, which is available in Art School. So Art School and I really are partners uh, from the very beginning, and their work is really absolutely phenomenal. And that is why I am so excited. Despite being so busy, he was driving. We could not find it. We kept on missing each other and couldn't find the time to speak. But Rev Gedalia, and let me just say a shout out to his son, Aaron Zlotowitz, uh, who's really been an incredible partner and friend, beginning with the founder of Art School, Rev Mayer Zlotowitz, uh, have really been incredible partners to the work that I have done. Uh, along with NCSY. And that is why it's such a privilege that Rev. Gedalia took the time. He was driving. He said, look, we're going to make this happen. He was driving to the mountains, so I really apologize. Some of the quality of the of the call is not what we are normally used to, but I really wanted to include him because he's been such an incredible friend and partner in everything uh, that we do. So it's really our absolute pleasure to begin our tour of the great Jewish publishers with our conversation with Rev. Gedalia Zlotowitz. So I'm talking to a lot of the major heads of the Jewish publishing world, and you obviously uh, are the are the head of Art School right now. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why did Art School get started. There were other publishing houses. What exactly prompted the start of Art School? When my father started Art School as a publishing house, he did not attend for it to be a publishing house. Um, if you ask him the question, I guess he never saw the film on my father's life. But my father is an artist at trade. And, you know, when he was 21, he started a business called Art Scroll, where he was doing subos and calligraphy. Just, and that's how he got the name Art Scroll. And in 1976, he had a good friend who passed away 
without leaving any children. His friend was in his 30s. And my father always loved writing. And he decided that by the Shloshim, he would do a translation, a commentary on the Gil Sester for in time for Purim. It was like two months before Purim when his friend was next to that. And I remember he stayed up many nights. He slept a few hours a night here or there just to get it done by the Shloshim. And he decided to print whatever, 2,000 copies, I think it was. And the first year alone, they sold 20,000 copies. Wow. He saw there was such a thirst for Torah knowledge, you know, true, authentic Torah knowledge based on, you know, rabbinic sources and Midrashim, that he decided, you know, if Megillah Sesta went so well for Purim, might as well do Megillah Rus for Shuvit. And the same reaction, the overwhelming positive reaction. People were so excited that for the first time they were able to get something like this. And he went on, he continued, he did Eichel Fatishabov, and then the rest is history. I always say that the success of Art Scroll is because he didn't plan it. Hashem just put everything in place. He did it as a chesed for a friend who passed away. And as we say, the rest is history. I grew up reading all of the Art Scroll biographies, and there's something really amazing that I noticed specifically in the biography of your father. You know, a, a lot of people, and I think very unfairly so, criticize Art Scroll for like whitewashing and not telling the whole story about the struggles of, you know, the Gedolim Jewish leaders. But in the biography of your father, there is a story that I, I've shared, and it, it, it was so impactful to me, that he was divorced. And the night, or soon after he got divorced, he went to his Rebbe, Rav Moshe Feinstein, and wanted to get a little bit of comfort, and Rav Moshe wasn't able to you know, give him the time or the attention that he was looking for and noticed and later that night, it was in the middle of the winter, he heard a knock on the door, and it was Rav Moshe Feinstein who came in to comfort him and to tuck in the children. I, I assume you were one of them. Um, I, I'm, yes. I'm curious, number one, you, you, you remember that night? No. I was five years old. I did not remember. But when I read the story, I was just as amazed, and it's such an emotional story. Can I ask you a question about the story? I mean, it, it's a jaw-dropping story, and I personally, I had interacted with your father specifically through NCSY. I was always so gracious to the work that we do. I was surprised that you included a story about his divorce. Was it a conversation whether or not that should be included in his biography? When I spoke to our, our dear friend, Charlie Besser, yes. about writing the biography, I told him that the most important thing to me is that we tell the truth about my father's struggle because that is the story. Everyone would think that Mayor Zlatowicz was born, you know, a genius, and everything went great for him in his life. I, I always say, I spoke last week, and I sent this yeshiva in Yushalayim, and I paint this picture about this kid who was overweight, who couldn't play sports, who went to camp, and he had a very bad stutter. You know, the kid you would label today as the born loser. And then when people hear that that was Bayez Lotto, they can't believe it. Wow. And to me, telling that story and writing the story in the biography, you know, and I, I spoke to my siblings and they were all on board with this, that, they, you know, to just tell the story of Bayez Lotto, it's the genius, what he created, it's a nice story, it's a feel-good story, but it's not going to help anyone. And my father's whole life is about encouraging people to bring out the best in them, and it comes out through the biography. And the only way to do that is to let people know you could have a struggle, but you could overcome it and change the world. 
So it was a conscious decision to do that. It's an incredible biography, and I found it like really deeply moving. I mean, I, I love a lo- really all the Art Scroll biographies, but if there's one that I recommend, uh, it's really that one because it tells that story. I'm curious now that you know there's been a major leadership transition. You run Art Scroll now, and you've taken over this massive publishing house that you know has already translated all of the talmud it's already translated most of the main rishonim on chumash the ramban uh it's later the orachayim for you what do you feel like is the next frontier for art scroll so what we're seeing is that you know people are learning more than they ever have in the past if i would tell you 30 years ago that You'll meet a regular Balabas, and he's learning Tafiomi and devoting an hour a day, and many people more than that, to learning Tafiomi and going through Shas and being proud to go through Shas. You would say it's impossible. That was meant for very special people. You know, lucky in, you know, in between Minchamayr to grab a, a Yaakov share and hear some, um, you know, speak about Agatha. But that people are learning Gemara is an incredible thing. And it's really widespread on a level that's unprecedented. What we're finding is that people are looking for more. They're searching for more. And they went through the cycle of Yomi once, twice. Some people are on the fourth time. But I don't believe there's a real sense of fulfillment. You know, we always say the difference between Ruchnius and Gashmius that when you deal with Ruchnius, the more you learn, the more you learn Torah, the more spiritual you get, the more you want. You don't, you never get full of it. You want more. Sure. Whereas when it comes to a Dovagashmi, you know, you could love it, delicious rib steak, but if I put five of them in front of you and you finish them, and another five, at a certain point, Enough you're going to be so disgusted, you wouldn't even want to look at a rib steak for weeks. So we're finding that the thirst for Torah knowledge and deeper Torah knowledge is just growing. And that's why the project I personally am so excited about now is the Toshos project. I received an email last week from a fellow by the name of Ken Wilson. You'll read this email, David. You're going to be blown away. I can send it to you. Tell me I'm allowed to share it. Please. This is a fellow who grew up as a reformed Jew. He said he barely knew how to read Hebrew but Mitzvah, he memorized the parasha, and he got through it. In his 20s, he became a lawyer, and he was in the army, he was a lawyer for the army. He moves to North, he's been stationed in Norfolk, Virginia, and he's outside, and he meets somebody, a Jew, and the person tells him, why don't you come to a shir? He didn't know what a shir was, he didn't know it was an Orthodox school, he only knew about reform. He didn't even know he was in his young 20s. He didn't know there was such a thing as Torah Shabbat. This is what he writes me in email. I never heard of such a thing. I knew the five books of Moses. That's it. He said, I started learning. I became religious. I started learning Tafiomi. And I just knew there was more to Torah. He says, five years ago, someone gave him our preview edition that we did on Tosos Market. He started learning Tosos. He said, a day doesn't go by that he doesn't learn Tosos, that he doesn't think about Tosos. He can't imagine a day in his life without Tosos. He already made a him on markets with every Tosos. He just made a him on brachos, and wow. he's starting to look at it. This is a person who, until he was in his 20s, didn't know Torah about that existed. But once he started learning, he knew that there was more and more and deeper in understanding. And I believe that's where the trend is. I think that we're living in a world where people want deeper learning, higher level learning, and that's where it's going on one end. At the same time, we're seeing people turn a little more to Hasidus. You know, they like that idea of learning some Hasidus. And, you know, we, we, we do get requests, and we're actually publishing in September the Kedusha Slavi and elucidation of Kedusha Slavi. Wow. wow. I did not know that. That's very exciting. Yeah, it's just going to be fascinating where that takes us. It's like two totally different tracks, 
But that's the thirst for people to broaden their Torah knowledge. Correct. It's the same track. It's the track that of, of hungry for that spirituality and substance that you've been providing uh, all these years. You and I worked on this project together, a partnership between NCSY and Art Scroll, uh, where we republished the R.E.A. Kaplan books. So much of what Art Scroll has done has really been creating quality literature, not just for Tosos and for advanced study, but for children and teenagers. What demographic do you feel like is the most underserved by Jewish publishers that we need to serve? We need to find more things to publish for them. I would say probably ages 11 to 15. Yes, yes. I think we have a lot of literature for younger children, you know, illustrated children's books, and there's a lot for adults. But that age of, you know, that child becoming Barabat Mitzvah, to speak to them on their level, in their language, examples that relate to them in the society they're growing up in, I think that is one of the key demographics that's losing out right now that we're trying to focus on. And I am going to be your partner in that. We, we've spoken about that uh, that many times, and you should know my son, he's not in, he's still in the in the six-year-old demographic, so he reads the Uncle Moishi Comes as a Shabbos Guest. That's his favorite <laughs> book. He reads it every single night before he goes to sleep. I promise you, we, we, we try to be brief. I'm curious, is there a Jewish book that you love that is a non art scroll book. Now I'm not talking about a classic like uh, you know a Rajba or one of the Rishonim, but is there a, a book that Art Scroll didn't publish, didn't get to, that it, that is still one of your favorites? Listen, I remember growing up. I mean, you know, when I was uh, you know newly married, maybe I was a teenager still, and Feldine came out with the book All for the Boys. Ah, that's a book that just. He just touches your neshama to see how Mr. Herman was a Rabbi Herman. We would like to be called Mr. Sure. Herman. You know, grew up in an America that our children can't even imagine. You know, they hear about the most of them from Shabbos. They think that means turning off your cell phone. But you know, to hear about a generation where every Friday you were fired from your job, and that there were people who held on strong and beg people to send their children to, you know, yeshiva, and open up yeshivas, but everyone was mocking them and laughing at them and going against the trend. That's a book that just spoke to me because we have things in our life that we just have to be able to stay focused and not be swept away by the tides of society. And a book like that shows you that these people did it. And because of that, they have generations in their own families of, of Shomah Torah and Mitzvot and the, the amount of families that they save in a spiritual way is beyond imagination. No, it's, it's so an... That book really spoke to me. It's an incredible book. I mean, in the back of my head, I was kind of hoping that you would say my own book, the top five, uh, which uh, Art Scroll passed on, but it's okay. I think all for the boss. Uh, definitely uh, surpasses my own. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good number two. It's a good number two. <laughs> I, I always ask my guests a rapid fire question. I, I'm I'm curious if somebody gave you just an unlimited amount of resources and allowed you personally to take a sabbatical and go back to school and either get a PhD or write your own book. What book would you want to write if you had no other responsibilities? Again, you're talking about a classic or a topic? A topic. I, I would love to be, again, to be able to get into the, the head of a teenager, a struggling teenager, and this is a passion of mine, and make them believe that they just have to focus on the skills and the talents that Hashem gave them, and they should use it, and not worry about what everyone else is doing and everyone else's accomplishments are, but really look into themselves and say, I was put on this world for a purpose, 
I'm going to figure out what that is, and I'm going to go ahead and do it. To me, it's a passion. I, I spent my summers in Camp Monk. My wife, I was there as a counselor, as assistant head counselor. Now, there, my wife is the camp mother, and I look at these boys who go to yeshiva, and not everyone can make it in yeshiva, and many of them struggle. They feel like they're in this box, and camp is an opportunity for them to use talents that they have, and I, every time I have a chance to speak to them, it's to stress this message of don't let anyone get you down. Don't look at what other people are accomplishing. Look at your talents and accomplish what you can. I was there speaking to Eric Yisrael, my father's yard side. I went. He's one of the Magide Shur the mayor. He told me such a beautiful story. He said that someone went to um, the Rebbe of Zisha, and he said, if you could be Avram Avido, would you want to be Avram Avido? So he answered him brilliantly. He says, if I would be Avram Avido, then Avram Avido would have to be the Rebbe of Zisha, because Hashem does the need to Avram Avido. Avram mm-hmm. Avido had his mission, and the Rebbe of Zisha had his mission. So there's no point in me being Avram Avido. Avram Avido did what he has to do as Avram Avido, but I have to do what I can as Rav Zusha. And I think that message is so important for today's generation. There's so much noise, and there's so much, you know, kids feel so down because they're on social media and they're watching what their friends are doing and what other people are doing, and it's such a fake world. My, my daughter always uses the example about, you know, this couple gets married and they're a few months into the marriage, and on Instagram, the wife takes a picture of this gorgeous gourmet dinner she makes for her husband and posts it. And you think of all the jealousy, how all the other husbands are going, wow, oh, look at that wife. But they don't show her the, the picture that 10 minutes before they were arguing, and 10 minutes later she's giving him a hard time because he didn't help clean up, he's complaining about this. That you don't see. Mm-hmm. And it's a very dangerous world, and we have to give our youth the confidence that they have a mission that no one else in this world has. I absolutely love that. My my final question always is I'm always fascinated by people's sleep schedules. So if you'll indulge me, what time do you go to sleep at night and what time do you wake up in the morning? I try to be asleep by at 11.30 and I get up at about 5.30 in the morning. Rebbe Gedalia, I cannot thank you enough. I, I know you're so busy. I'm so glad I was able to catch you. It really means a lot. Namir Sashem will catch up in person at the offices and plan together uh, our next project. Thank you, David. You shall continue that sloch in your amazing avodas like Kodesh. Especially you're dealing, you're dealing with those youth. Tell them. Let, I'll, I'll leave you one part. I always say this over. We wake up every morning, we say, We thank Hashem for giving us another day. And we end up, We're talking to Hashem, we say, Great is your emuna, is your belief. Not just the way that our belief. No, you know it's telling us. Beautiful. Us. You believe that we could accomplish our mission. Let's not waste it. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you again so, so much, and hope that we are in touch soon. You should be blessed. Thank you. Be well, Rabbi Dahlia. Thank you again. That story that's included in the Art Scroll biography of Rabbi Gedalia Zlotowicz uh, is something that has absolutely always moved me. And the fact that Rav Meir Zlotowicz, the founder of Art Scroll, and Art Scroll gets this rap of only including the highlight reel uh, in their biographies and the leaders, but it, and it is the farthest thing from the truth in the actual biography of Rav Meir Zlotowicz, which is really so deeply moving. Somebody who struggled with his looks, with a stutter, and this story of his divorce and how Rav Moshe Feinstein came out is really something that has always stayed with me when I read this within the biography. I mean, my, my, my heart shattered into a thousand pieces. I'll read the relevant lines from that biography right now because I found it uh, so, so deeply moving. In 1971, he, referring to Mayor Zlotowitz and his wife, divorced. At the darkest point, the flicker of light that ushered in the brighter days came from the most radiant man in Rav Meir Zlotowitz's world, his Rebbe, Rav Moshe Feinstein. 
It came at a time when Reb Mayer felt he had hit rock bottom. The business was in debt. He was raising three children on his own, and his friends were busy with their own lives while he was alone. He wasn't able to learn properly since after long, wearying days at work, he would come home and take care of his children. He went to Rav Moshe's Lower East Side apartment, waiting in the family foyer for a chance to share his pain with his beloved Rosh Hashiva. But Rav Moshe was meeting with a group of rabbis involved in a complicated halachic issue. He returned home, the load feeling heavier than ever before. The next day, New York suffered a major snowstorm, making car travel difficult. Schools were closed, and Rav Meir spent the day at home watching his young children. That evening, as the harried young father struggled to get the children to bed, the doorbell rang. Rav Meir walked downstairs and opened the door, wondering who could have ventured out in the snowy night. It was Rav Moshe Feinstein. The Rosh Hashiva, postic of his generation and leader of thousands, accompanies his Talmud up several flights of stairs, coming into the apartment and taking in the scene. Rav Moshe lifted one child, then the next, and finally the third one. He tucked each one into bed, telling them a story and kissing them goodnight. Then when the house was settled, Rav Moshe looked at Rav Meir. I came to Shmuz to hear what's on your mind, he said. Rav Meir spoke, really spoke, sharing his doubts and fears about his future, and Rav Moshe listened. The story like that, uh, really just my esteem, uh, for Rav Moshe Feinstein, of course, but for Rav Meir Zlotowitz, uh, to really come from nothing and have a struggling business and to have created Art Scroll in the memory of a friend who died without children, just the whole founding story is everything that Art Scroll has come to contribute to the world of being able to preserve the memory of somebody and to take the great edifice of Jewish ideas and to preserve that in the English language for the world is a merit that is really unspeakably huge and the foundational story of how deeply moving and emotional and how honest and upright they are with their own struggles uh, is really something that we don't normally associate with Art Scroll, but we should give them all the credit in the world. It's a biography that if you haven't read already, Rav Meir Zlata, which is one of the foundational personalities of American Judaism, and to learn more about him and his contribution and what Art Scroll is all about is something uh, that you really, really should take the moment open up the biography written by my dearest friend, Srili Besser, who was my editor when I, when I used to work for Mishpacha magazine. Uh, take a look. It is really, really some of the most moving things uh, that I have ever read. But it's not just Art Scroll. I, I feel like I have an Art Scroll heart, uh, but in many ways, uh, a lot of the more intellectual essays that I like to read are from our friends at Koren. And Koren, of course, are the dearest friends and have really contributed so much to the work that I do, uh, really within NCSY as well, the same way that we partnered with Art Scroll uh, for the Rabbi Arya Kaplan collection. We partnered with Corin when NCSY published the NCSY Sitter uh, that was edited uh, by my friend and former colleague, Dr. Debbie Stone, uh, really an incredible scholar, uh, in her own right, and while we were working together, uh, she partnered with Corin and published this incredible NCSY sitter, a sitter for NCSY teens. Uh, she did an incredible job of that, and it was through that that I met uh, and really became quite enamored with the great Matthew Miller, a personality of personalities, no holds barred. I worked with him more when I worked with Corin, and we did such incredible uh, work together. I got to know Matthew a lot more. He is really an incredible personality, and Corin has been so incredibly generous to me, uh, really on a personal level. I remember I shared that I am working uh, with Tablet Magazine and uh, Take One, the podcast that I work with, our, my friend Liel Leibovitz and the Take One podcast team. And we, you know, include these these short ideas about the daily daf and daf yomi, the daily Talmud. And Koran heard that I was doing it, and guess what showed up at my door? An entire set of Koran Talmud. Uh, that is not a small thing. That is a very generous gift. And Koran has always been so incredibly generous, uh, just sending me their latest books, their latest works. 
Uh, and really, all of my friends out there in Corin are friends to the 1840 podcast. We've had so many of their authors on our show uh, and plan on only having more, which is why it was such a pleasure and privilege to have our friend, Matthew Miller, the head of Corin Publishers. What's the origin of Corin? Why was it started? Let me give you Adam Richard and Al, Adam Bate. Adam one and Adam two, the two the two origin stories. Yeah, yeah, the origin story. Corin was started in the nineteen fifties. Actually, it's, it was officially formed in nineteen sixty two. Um, set up by Mister Corin, who was a refugee from Germany, and I guess he came. He came from Germany in nineteen thirty three, so he got out at a good, you know, a relatively good time. Um, came to Israel, and I guess he was part of that. He's been what called the heroic generation, and he was a graphic designer. He designed. He worked for the Sachnut. He designed the um, city of uh, Jerusalem emblem with the with the lion rampant, and he had this. How do you say juke? He had this obsession. Yeah. Um, with the text of the Tanakh. I, I guess one of the good things about being this audio is you can cut wherever you want. If I'm going on too long, no. I don't know if you're aware, but all Tanakh texts, I mean, there were printers in the 15th century in what's called the Incunabula period, uh, Jewish printers, very early on in, in Italy, in Portugal, I think in Spain, I'm not sure about Spain, certainly Portugal, um, that produced Jewish texts. However, by around 1500, the church, you know, clamped down on this new technology, and you had to have a license to uh, publish anything. And they, of course, worked with Bomberg, Daniel Bomberg, who was actually a Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. That's where sure. living in Venice. And, you know, he did some magnificent work. Um, you know, the, the, the Talmud, the Mikrit Kutalot, all that stuff that's still used today. But they used the Christian version of the Tanakh text. And that's what Jews used for about 450 years. And as part of the whole Zionist return to the land movement, Mr. Koren felt that you, know, you have to have a Jewish edited Tanakh text. And at that time, this is you know, in, the, in the 50s, before the uh, uh, Aleppo Codex was, was taken out and burned, well, half of it was burned. Um, the oldest, of course, was the Leningrad uh, Codex. Mm -hmm. Sure. So he he put together a team. It took him about ten years. I'm giving you the really short form of this. He put together a team that restored the text, restored the original partiot, uh, made thousands of corrections, and that became the Tanakh Koren, which is the quasi official, you know, uh, Tanakh of the land uh, of, of even the state of Israel today. Um. So it's a, um, it was, he, he designed a typeface just for the Tanakh, because he felt Tanakh should have its own typeface, not used for anything else. Uh, but that's the kind of guy he was, you know, yeah. kind of obsessive compulsive, uh, in, in the best sense of the word. Anyway, he, uh, he did that. He brought it out. It was a, it, it, it was a very, it was a real big, Huge event here. About it was successful. So, so the couple of very successful, and and it's been so. And then in the nineteen seventies, eighties, he came out with Sidurim and Machsirim, uh, again with his crew of scholars, including Rav Medan's father and uh, Goldhaber, and he even designed a separate font for that. Corin is always very proud of its fonts. I always admire. I. I I happen to be font obsessive, but I love that Corin always like you know highlights we have our own special font. Well, it's very funny. Um, so I asked one of our senior typographers who was trained by Mr. Corin. Her name is Esther Bear. She was hired in the in the seventies or eighties. Um, yeah, she was hired in the seventies. She's been with the company fifty years, 40, 50 years. Um, and she said, you know, I said, well, why why did Mr. Corin never do a, um, a Rashi, a homage with Rashi. Yeah. And she said he never liked the Rashi script. 
<laughs> Font motivated. He never. And then this this is where it gets actually interesting. I'm going to go ahead and come back. About 10 years ago, we were moving offices and we found a box that hadn't been opened in many, many decades. We, we found hand drawn Rashi font. He was he was try he was attempting to reinvent the Rashi script. He almost finished it. So what we did is we finished it, digitalized it, and now our Humash with Rashi is beautiful and the most legible Rashi font available. We sell it in uh, Israel very successfully, and we're we'll be introducing it in the states as well um, because it's his Rashi. <laughs> Sounds crazy, but that's the way it was. Anyway, um, the company went on. Uh, and it was selling its Tanakhim. It had like it had like four people in the company, three people in the company. You know, we open up at eight, close at one, and that was it for the day. And then I acquired the company in two thousand seven. Why would you buy a publishing company? Were you a publisher? Were you a writer? Or were you angels, just bored? Angels rush in. We're you know we, no sorry fools rush in. We're angels dare not tread. Let me back up. Um, I despite my. Brooklyn accent. I lived in England for over 20 years. At the university there, came back, worked there, so to speak. and that six months I was working there turned into 18 years. Uh -huh. so, so what industry that, were you working in in England? Uh, uh, heavy uh, industrial products, heavy consumer products. Doesn't you know, sound that, like a publisher. That wasn't a publisher, but you know we had about a dozen subsidiaries, and I was literally on a plane probably almost but well, certainly every week but almost every day because we had subsidiaries from ireland to hungary i was flying to china I was flying to the state you know I was, I was working very very hard for 20 years not that i'm not working hard now and he um and i'm a bookaholic i mean you know you ever get onto an airplane and you forget to bring a book I happen to be a bookaholic. between me you and the doorpost i hope my rabbi aren't listening i'm a movie guy on airplanes I can't. I have a hard time reading on airplanes. Well, that's. I won't tell your name if you don't tell your name. But when you're flying, uh, you know, between let's say you know London and Germany or Italy and Paris, there are no movies. Uh huh. Okay. So yes, then I would have my book. I would more likely an article or magazine. But yes, I'd be fidgety. Yeah, I can't read out a book. Um, God knows how many I have. So I started. You know, so when I when the company in, in Europe was sold, we decided to make Aliyah. And like a lot of people in their early middle age, I you know kind of reinvented myself. And I knew I loved books, and I also knew that I didn't have it in me to write. You know the movie? Did you ever see the movie Amadeus? Yes, I know the movie Amadeus. It, it's fascinating because you know it was written by a Jew. Name it was originally on, on in Broadway or the West End in London. And it's a story, I, I'm meandering, but you'll see my point. Um, and it's about a composer in um, Vienna called Salieri. And Salieri is the court composer. And he's given many commissions. He's very successful. He, he meets Mozart, who is this disgusting, foul-mouthed creature who writes the most beautiful music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he can't reconcile this fact that, you know, how does God work that he creates this person? And he dedicates now, this is where I, he dedicates the rest of the movie, how to kill Mozart. That's what the whole thing is about, out of, out of revenge, because God gave Mozart the talent, and he, he says, he gave me the talent to appreciate it, the ability to appreciate it, but not compose it. Okay. I'm the anti-Salieri. He gave me the ability to appreciate scholarship, to appreciate writing, and not the talent to do it. Gotcha. So instead, I became a publisher. Gotcha. So at least I can enable other people to do it. So I started um, Toby Press, uh, which was, you know, slept along. Um, slept along a bit. Um, we did some good stuff. You probably know Yehuda Avner as the uh, Prime Minister's. Sure. That was massively successful. Made into a couple of movies. And um, it wasn't satisfying. I, I didn't find it satisfying because you know when you're in the trade book business it's never about the publishers or, or the brand like if i said to you quick who is stephen king's publisher your answer is i don't know i have no idea yeah correct exactly and 
everything is book to book to book, and there's no building blocks, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and I, I, it was very frustrating for me. And then I mentioned the British background because, of course, England's a small community. Everybody knows everybody. And I got to know Rabbi Saxman, the chief rabbi. And I had heard, then we made Ali on 99. I heard around 2004, 5, 6, you know, my dates are fuzzy. He was looking for a Jewish publisher. Uh, he wanted to publish his Sidur out of England, which was the official. He wanted to do some others. So he was, he was looking for a Jewish publisher as opposed to a trade publisher. Mm-hmm. Was a trade for his called Secular Books. Gotcha. So I, I, I made Aliyah, I fell in love with Koran. Um, it pushed all my buttons. Um, you know, it was... At this point, you, you don't own Koran yet, do you? No, 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 but I'm about to now. With this. Okay. But I, but I, I fell in love with it before, you know, because, I mean, I knew it was the highest academic standards, the highest scholarship standards, and I'm, I'm a wannabe academic. Um, I, the design is fabulous. As we just, as we know, and the you know the last thing is, it's Zionist. All my buttons were pushed, and I thought, well, if I could buy it and revitalize it and maybe publish, and people in America kind of knew about it, but not really. Yeah, so it, it was enough of an orthodox base that I felt I could take this and make it a vehicle for publishing initially Rabbi stuff in, Rabbi Sachs' stuff in English. The Sidur came out, so we, I bought it in 2007. Uh, two years, we worked very hard. We had to digitalize everything. Uh, There's a lot of uh, homework to do. And we brought up the Sachs Sidur in 2009, and it was very successful. And then we, um, a couple of years later, we brought out his Maxarim, Rosh Hashanah. Beautiful, yes. So, let me ask you this question. When you say a book is very successful, maybe you could let us peek behind the publisher's cloak. G- give me the, the kind of the bell curve of what it means to be a successful book in the Jewish world. W- what does that mean? Your average book, let's say, not Rabbi Sachs, you know, somebody who they publish a fine book on, uh, I don't know, their ideas on the Parsha, their their essays. How many copies should that expect to sell? Listen, there's an expression in England uh, It goes, how long is a piece of string? What do you mean by that? Exactly. Every, it's different courses for different horses. Uh-huh. In other words, if you are bringing, like, for example, we work very closely with uh, why you reads and people like that. Now, if they bring out a, a book on halakha, that's Daniel Feld, Rabbi Feldman. Sure, former oh, guest, a close friend. When 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 he when he brings out a book, if we're selling, uh, and and they're doing halacha titles to a very very high and I don't want to say esoteric standard, but you know you, you know it's not it's not it's, it's not nitty gritty. Either. It's not for the masses necessarily. Yeah. I mean, if that book sells a couple of thousand copies, we're thrilled. You know because. There's not that many people who are going to be learning at that level. Uh, if we're talking about a Rabbi Sachs book, we're talking in the many, many, many thousands. More than th- more than t- tens of thousands, you think? Yeah, you know. So it, it all depends on on the title. I, you know, there's no one rule. Yeah. Aside from Rabbi Sachs, who's I think it's fair to say is the crown jewel of Koran. You know, like uh, a, of a the, crown jewel, a crown jewel, a crown jewel. Um, a couple of years later, Rabbi uh, Steinsalz's organization went through a, a change, and uh, the new director, who's Rabbi uh, Steinsalz's son, you know, approached me and we said, "Look, you know, we we really need it. We we would like to work with a publishing partner." And within a very very short time, this is probably around two thousand. I'm, I'm trying to remember when the cycle started. Well, the cycle before this current one on the Talmud was it 2011. He said, "Look, we 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 need a partner to publish, and he we, we need a partner. But we want to concentrate on the scholarship. We need somebody to work with." So we ended up very quickly making an agreement to publish in Hebrew and English. They were also looking for a publisher in France, but we didn't have, you know, from a, a publishing from a printing side, we could do it. But from a 
distribution side, you know, in, in France, Belgium, and Quebec, we have no distribution. Well, we do in Quebec, but uh, it's a small Jewish market. So um, we, and then we worked together very hard, very quickly. We brought up the Quarantan and Bobbly over the, in tandem with the, the new cycle. Did you work directly with Rav Steinsaltz in, in developing that plan, or he was he already kind of like, more on the like behind the scenes or, or less active in the actual management. I worked with him. I met him. I met with him many, many, many times. But by this point, his two sons, uh, many and Amichaya, were actually running the. the Amichaya is more the uh, scholarship brother, and many is more the commercial brother. Um, and I don't know if you remember Thomas Nissel was in there. Okay. He passed away. Um, so I was not working with Rob Steinfeld on a daily basis, but I do know he reviewed everything. Mm-hmm. And he was also working on other projects, his, his, his Tanakh, which came out later, and, and other things. Slowly, we made many, many um, I guess partnerships. We made a partnership with YU, uh, which has been a very happy one, a partnership with the OU Press. We made partnerships with... Uh, Yeshiva uh, We Makan. have a partnership with NCSY. We did a sitter together. Excuse me. Oh, well, yeah, the OU. And, no, but yeah. there's many parts of the OU. So parts of the OU were the NCSY section. Sure. We worked with uh, Yachat for the creating that door. We work with the OU Press. We work with, uh, you yeah, know, so we work with, you know, the, the different parts of, of the OU. Um, we work with, um, we, we, we'll be doing, um, uh, Rav Kaplan's books in, in Hebrew. Amir uh, Hashem. Yeah. That's an exciting project. Let me ask you, in terms of submissions, you know, everybody, I know so many people, maybe I get these questions more than others, who they want to write a book. They want to they wanna be published. You know, you, seems like there must have been a point on some long flight uh, to Germany where in the back of your head he says, I should probably write my own book. Uh, what is that? Never. No. But 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 people I wouldn't, do. I wouldn't. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't will that. I wouldn't wish that on my friends. Uh huh. But people people have the itch. It's a dangerous itch. Here's my question: What is a book topic, subject, or title that you wish you got less submissions for? And what is a book topic or title that you wish you got more submissions about? I will quote my wife first. Everybody's got at least one book within them, and that's probably where you should stay. So, so let me um, <laughs> let, let, let me uh, <laughs> move on from there. Um, I um, let me think. I'm, I'm trying. To, I'm trying to figure if I can say this without giving offense. Um, there is a lot of look. Every rabbi has to do Parsha Shavua. Very few Parsha Shavua. So they all have these collections of Parsha Shavua. Sure. They're, oh, they're sermons. They're, yeah. It's rare. I, I gotta, it's rare to find ones that still resonate. It's very, very rare. And dare I say, most of them are, are not of popular interest. That was very politically correct of you to say. Very yeah, gentle. Well, 20, Twenty years in England, I'm toilet trained. I see. Yeah, uh, I see you holding back, but but I I think between between your pauses, I, will, I, I, I will hear what you are me. saying. Yes, I will tell you what I. Actually, you were involved in this. Um, I was listening. I, I remember we were coming back from Pesach. We were driving home from the north, mostly uh, Hag, and we were you know we turned on your program and you were interviewing um, that rabbi from Teaneck and I, Rex, Rex Nord, Rexworth the, the chap with the um, Roth uh, Lex? yes yes with the anorexia discussion yes sure I tell you my wife and I we were like floored at that we were just overwhelmed at that uh, on many levels you know the actual problem the uh, the way he and his daughter presented it, the whole thing. It, I mean, it's hard to drive when you're crying. 
Yeah. But, so I actually spoke to him the week later, and I begged him to publish a book on it. He's, wow. He's still, I don't know. You may want to cut this out of the if you you may want to no. you, want, you may want to cut this out of your podcast because he hasn't come back to me. But I mean, a book like that because in, in the Orthodox world, um, okay, like for example, kind of in this not not the same genre. This is not. I'm not comparing. Uh, we did a book by uh, Orion Mevorach in Israel, which is now coming out in English. Well, it's in translation now. And it's dealing with uh, the issues of sneot, uh for women. And it's not a, it's not a, a book that uh, the usual sort of like, you have to be it's not, it's not like that. It's, it's <laughs> okay. his positive version. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you say the Orthodox world is, is kind of like the wizarding world, and there's the muggles out there, but with the wizarding world, yeah. you know, there's a way of speaking within the Orthodox world, not down at people, but with people. So whether it's the rabbi with the, with the daughter with uh, this particular eating disorder, or whether it's Oria's or Mivarach's book on Stewart, or whether it's books that address issues that we're wrestling with, not halachic issues. You know, do we, do we really want another book on Bishul Shabbat, on the halachot, the Bishul Shabbat, I mean, haven't we pretty much covered it over the last 2,000 years? But you want books are, that are talking with you. I like that a lot. Yeah, I mean, I mean about, you know, and I feel like both of these particular uh, authors are, or, well, I don't know if he's an author, I hope he is. You know, they're dealing with problems that our, our community is having, and you can't deal with it in a Hilani way because. The concept of snut in today's Hilani society, you know, bistum shogun, there's, there's nothing there. It doesn't exist. So how do you how do you talk to our children about issues with how do you talk about how do you talk to our children and ourselves with, about issues of moral value? Because you ain't going to get that from the, the on the one hand, you're not going to get it from the Hilani world. They don't take us they don't, they don't take that seriously. On the other hand, from the Haredi world, I don't think they're speaking. I feel like there's a bit of talking down to you. And that's not what is good. You need to talk with. I, 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 hope, I, have, I hope I'm getting. No, I, I, un I understand what you're saying. There's certainly in the writing styles of different no, publishers. It's also the talkless and the material. Yeah, I think there are different ways in which people kind of present these, and I think uh, some other writers, speakers, personalities, I don't know if it, if it goes on sharp, um, you know, hashkafic lines, but, but I do see a difference, and I think there's something markedly different about the way Koran authors kind of walk with their audience that I find very moving. I think so, a, a good example of this, though it's it's extremely high level and very sophisticated, is the uh, the Jewish Thought series from my friend Natano Wiederblink, which is I mean it, it's a tour de force. It, you know, it's two, you've mm -hmm. already published two out of three volumes. I, I, I'm so fascinated by Cora, and I want to hear just kind of to wrap up because we, I, I'm trying to do these profiles of all the major Jewish publishers. And I'm curious for two questions uh, to wrap up before I do my usual rapid-fire questions. Of all of the Koran books, all of the Jewish Koran books, that um, not your bread and butter, Rabbi Sachs, Rabbi Steinsaltz, what is the book that you are the most proud of and personally enjoy reading the most? I love all my children. Of course. But of course um, you do. But okay, number one, I, I, you say not bread and butter. And, I'm basically I mean, saying you can't choose a Rabbi Sachs book, we'll, 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 or Rabbi Steinsaltz. A listen, book. I was at, I was at, sorry, I was at Hebrew University two days ago. They gave me a post a post mortem honorary degree. You know, would, oh, wow, and they, Mazel yeah, Tov. And, you know, and, and, did it, and I, tell you, I was crying. I really miss him. I miss him. I don't think we were friends. We were prof we were very professional together. Uh, we were mm -hmm. not, but I miss him and I miss his voice. So no, I'm not going to take a restriction. I, I think 
if you read his books like uh, Ethics in the Parsha, um, Leadership in the Parsha, Life-Changing Events in the Parsha, it brings the Parsha not just what, it brings it so immediate. It brings it to such immediacy that, you know, uh, he is a moral voice that is now gone. And I think that if there's any weak, if there is a weakness in the Jewish Orthodox community, it's not dealing with those kinds of issues as he did. Number two, um, we just published a book by um, uh, Rabbi uh, Sharon Shalom. He's an Ethiopian rabbi mm-hmm. of a of an Ashkenazi minion of an Ashkenazi Beit uh, Knesset. Uh, uh, and um, it's a conversation of he with his wife, who is an Ashken- who's, who's a granddaughter of a Polish of a Polish um, of, a, of a Holocaust survivor, and it's it's, it's literally called a dialogue of, dialogues of love, and it's um, it's a wonderful book, a non koran Jewish book that you love, an English book, non koran English Jewish book that you love. So you know you can't say, oh, I love the Rashba on Yavamas or Rabbeinu David on Psach. No fear. What is a, a non koran English book that's Jewish that you love? Ari Kaplan. He's the one that got away. Okay, and Art Scroll away. puts it out. We we partnered. It's an old but yeah, I'm, but you you do love and, and you know what? I appreciate your love for Arya Kaplan. It means it means so much to me because of my involvement in that book and I'm so excited to be working with you on the on the on the Hebrew on the Hebrew ones and the the respect and esteem that you give to his written legacy so uh, is is not lost on me. It's it's really really moving. Another tragic loss to the Jewish people. He died so young, and I will say Rabbi Steinsel's biblical portraits. Mm, that's a beautiful. He, book. he got in trouble over that. Rabbi steinsel has got in trouble constantly. He uh, loves did, getting in trouble. Did he like it? Well, he always, let me, as the story goes, he went to, he was invited to speak at the House of Lords in London. He goes to London. And you know, you've met, you met Rabbi Steinsaltz? I've never met him personally. Okay. Always wear a blue shirt, uh, the Borsalino. Suspenders? The, okay. What? Suspenders? Yeah, never, wore, never wore a tie. Okay, like a true. Just the House of Lords. The House of Lords is all House of Lords British-like. And they say, you know, they say, oh, excuse me, sir, but you must wear a tie. She says, oh, I don't wear a tie. So, well, you can't go in unless you wear a tie. Said, okay. Turned around and left. <laughs> and For was real. It. And he never spoke there. He just walked away. Yeah. <laughs> One of a kind. What a legend. You got, you, got, you got to be a real. I mean, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is that is very that is very very cool. I, I I always ask my interviews. Um, I always wrap up with with a little bit more rapid fire questions. I feel like we covered the first of those three questions, which are you know some book recommendations, the ones that you love, both inside and outside the Cohen Library. My next question hit might hit close to home in your own personal narrative, and that is if somebody gave you a great deal of money and allowed you to take a sabbatical for an entire year, or as long as it took, to go back to school and get a PhD, what do you think the subject and title of that PhD would be? I don't have, like I said, I did my graduate work at Oxford, and I realized after a year, I mean, I got my degree, but I realized I don't have the zitzflash to get that academic degree. So... I took my took my degree, took my master's, and we came home. So to answer your question, I wouldn't do a PhD. I would sit and keep doing what I'm doing. It'd be nice to have the money in the bank. <laughs> I don't totally believe you that you are a you know you you have the aspirations. You're surrounded by academics, and somewhere deep deep down in your unconscious. You, you don't have a little itch, you know, not enough to actually leave your work, but a little itch to have some subject that you wish you could totally immerse yourself if in. If you know you don't have the talent to excel, I'm not going to do it. I think we can ex- I can excel as a publisher. I think we've done a very good job. I've got a fabulous team by world-class standards, not just Jewish book publishing standards. No, by, world-class. By, 
by world, I have a, and I was able to achieve that. I'm very proud of that. But if I were an author, I would be mediocre. You'd be, but you, but you'd have beautiful fonts, no oh, matter it'd what. Be, it'd be gorgeous. Ooh, would those be good? Gorgeous mediocrity. <laughs> those are good looking, good looking fonts. My final question: I always ask my guests, what time do you go to sleep at night, and what time do you wake up in the morning? I try to go to bed by eleven. Try to wake up at six thirty. And if I get four or five hours sleep, that's it. <laughs> gotcha. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Matthew Miller, uh, it is such a pleasure not only speaking with you, but our professional relationship, our partnerships is something that I treasure. I'm excited to do more. Uh, one day, uh, I'm sure uh, either 1840 or David Beshevkin or both are going to come knocking on your doors. There's certainly more room for partnership in the future, and I cannot thank you enough for your in time the, today. In the, in the words of Rabbi Eastwood, make my day. <laughs> Matthew does not mince words. Uh, he really says it like it is. Uh, he's absolutely wonderful, kind of like unvarnished. Behind, He's always behind the curtain. He's never pulling punches, which is what makes him so charming and so amazing and such a really incredible person uh, to work with. And of course, shout out to Corin Fonts. If it were up to me, we would have an episode just about fonts. Uh, those who have ever worked with me in an educational setting talking about source sheets know that I can wax poetic about my favorite and least favorite fonts. Uh, a huge fan of Cambria, huge fan of Paulino Linotype. That's what I use whenever I draft books. Uh, obviously, I am a serif font man. I love the classiness of a serif font. I don't have time for the informality of a sans serif font. But before I get myself into trouble and lose more listeners by going on for another 40 minutes uh, in a in what should be a 10-second introduction to our final guest, um, I really uh, I, I really gotta stop talking about fonts. Uh, I really want to introduce our final guest, who is a return guest, a repeat guest, someone who we have had on before during our conversation on censorship, someone who is not only family to me, but has also been a colleague and partner of sorts, the same way I have partnered with Art Scroll on the R.A. Kaplan Collection, with Corin on the NCSY Sitter. I have had the absolute pleasure and pr privilege of partnering with Alti Carper, the great Alti Carper, on works together, particularly, believe it or not, on a cookbook. We published together, along with OU Press, the Covenant Cookbook, Covenant Winery, which is an absolutely delicious winery. If you ever have the opportunity to visit San Fran, you definitely need to check them out, and you could you could become a member of Covenant's Delicious Wine of the Month Club. They have all these delicious wines. I'm a huge lover of, uh, of wines. It's part of my Shabbos vacation mentality, having great wine at my Shabbos table. But the great Covenant Winery actually did a cookbook in partnership with OU. And I was the editor who was like brokering peace in the Middle East by figuring out how they could make sure all of their recipes were sufficiently halachic, how to make sure that they cohered with Jewish law. You're going to tell somebody how to make a chalant and how to keep it warm on Shabbos. You have to to make sure that you stay in line, and I had the unenviable task of making sure and brokering the deal that all of the recipes and the instructions and the process between OU Kosher and the publisher side, I was the go-between. I'm no expert in Jewish law, but I do know how to be a go-between and try to make sure that nobody comes to blows with one another, uh, which thank God we avoided, and in fact, when we finished... Our dear friends at Covenant Winery were kind enough to send me a bottle of their uh, signature uh, red wine, which really uh, made my day. I'm happy to edit more of their books. But it was through this process that I actually worked with Alti on bringing this to press. She was really, really incredible. And Alti is really the head, the person behind Shockin' Books. And Alti is a really a powerhouse like no other uh, when it comes to publishing. And Shockin', believe it or not... Uh, which is why I'm really concluding these interviews with Alti, because Shakin is really the grandfather of Jewish publishing. 
Uh, it's really an incredible historical story, and the life of Zalman Shakin, of which Shakin Books is named after, uh, is really a major chapter in Jewish history it- itself. There is a reason why the great Gershom Sholem, the, the great scholar of Jewish mysticism, why Franz Kafka, really some great towering figures uh, in Jewish literature, in Jewish scholarship, have all published with Shock in books, not to mention, of course, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, of which Alti spoke so eloquently about. And Alti, it, Alti does not like being on podcasts. This was a favor to me and one that I do not take for granted, but I could not talk about Jewish books without reaching out to my dearest friend. And really, it's more than that. It's family with Alti. Uh, and you can, of course, check out our original conversation that we had in our series on censorship, where he, she tells the unbelievable story uh, of the publication she had of the book One People, Two Worlds. But for right now, we're talking about the history of Shocking Books, what it represents. It is, it is really a, a force in the world of Jewish publishing, and that is why I am so excited to introduce our conversation with Alti Carper. I really, really appreciate this. I know it's not always your favorite thing, but hopefully we'll just get... It's my, my least favorite thing. <laughs> it's your least favorite thing. So we're going to hopefully spend your time on your least favorite thing, talking about your most favorite thing, and that is shocking books. Uh, a lot of people uh, are familiar with uh, Jewish publishing. They probably know a lot of shocking books, but they probably know very little about what exactly the story behind Shockin' Books is. You know, people know uh, Feldheim and Art Scroll. They don't, they don't always know the, the history, and it has one of the richest Jewish histories, and you currently run Shockin' Books. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what exactly is Shockin' Books about? Well, Shockin' Books was started in Germany in 1931 by a man named Salman, Salman Shockin. He was a merchant. He was um, uh, an owner of a chain of um, department stores. Um, this is sort of a side conversation, but the idea of department store, the concept of a department store, was actually invented by Jews in Germany um, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, prior to that, there were shops that sold men's clothing. There were shops that sold women's clothing. There were shops that sold housewares. Um, and th- this cohort of German Jews had the idea to put this all together into one department store. And Salman Schocken was one of those people. Um, and they very intelligently kind of carved up the German Empire so that they wouldn't be in competition with one another. So Salman Schocken's territory was in Prussia. It was in South um, East Germany. He had, he had 17 department stores. And he became incredibly successful at this. Um, but he was also um, a self-taught Jewish intellectual. He did not grow up with much of a Jewish consciousness. Um, his family were secularized Jews. Um, he read um, Martin Buber's Tales of the Hasidim as a young man, and that changed his life. Um, he realized that there was this enormously rich Jewish cultural heritage of which he was completely ignorant. Um, and he started reading up on Jewish history and culture, going all the way back to the Bible and and medieval works, philosophical works of the Renaissance. He became incredibly well-educated, and he um, decided that this was something that the very assimilated Jews of Germany needed to know, too, that there was this incredibly rich cultural uh, heritage of which most of them were ignorant. Um, So he started out um, by uh, being a patron to Jewish authors, um, Gershom Sholem was one, S.Y. Agnon was another, mo- uh, two famous ones, and, uh, and helping them get their books published. And then at one point he decided that he was going to be a publisher of these books himself. And this was in 1931 with the rise of Nazism. Jews all throughout Germany were being persecuted and they were not exactly sure what they were being persecuted about because they had no consciousness of what being Jewish was. So he started Shock and Books in 1931. Um, 
And then uh, with the rise of Nazi Germany and the Nuremberg laws, it just became increasingly difficult for Jewish publishers to function. He also, somewhere along the way, um, became a Zionist and, and developed a very strong political Zionist consciousness and became active in world uh, Zionism, the world Zionist movement. Um, so in 1935, he left Germany and left Schocken books um, in the hands of his lieutenants there. And he uh, first went to Switzerland and then uh, made Aliyah to Palestine and started a branch of Schocken books in Tel Aviv. In 1938, uh, Schocken books in Germany was closed by the Nazis after Kristallnacht. Um, and in the early 1940s, Salman Schocken, uh, very active at that point with the board of directors of what was becoming the Hebrew University, um, came to America. Uh, on a fundraising tour. He was very successful, but he also fell in love with America and just fell in love with uh, the uh, the intellectual energy and the spirit of the American Jews whom he met there, some of whom were German refugees from uh, Europe, as was he, and some were just uh, American intellectuals and uh, American business people. And he felt that what he was doing, what he had done in Germany, he was going to start now doing in America and then founded Shock and Books in America in 1945. Um, uh, by that point in time, his family was in Palestine. Um, he brought his son Theodore over to America to help him with the business. And that was the beginning of Shock and Books uh, in 1945. The first books that he published were translations of the books that he had published so successfully in Europe. Uh, Martin Buber and uh, Walter Benjamin uh, among them, and Gershom Scholem among them. And then eventually uh, bringing uh, uh, Kafka to this country, which had already The Trial and the Castle been published in the United States by Alfred A. Knopf in the 1930s. Um, but sometime in the in the 1940s, uh, uh, Schocken brought all of the Kafka works under the Schocken umbrella. So that he was the first to publish Kafka in English. Yeah, that was the first to publish Kafka in English was a UK publisher. Uh, I'm not. I think it was Collins, but I'm not. I'd have to look up. Uh, I would have to look that up. But it was Kafka's first English language publication was in England. First American uh, publication of Kafka. Gotcha. Was, Trial in the Castle was by Alfred A. Knopp in the 1930s. Wow. So I'm just so curious because the the life and the legacy of Zalman Shakin is so fascinating. His relationships, particularly with Gershom Sholem, if I if I recall correctly, they had a little bit of a falling out at some point. Uh, he he wasn't so pleased that Sholem didn't publish uh the, the Shabtai Tzvi book with Shakin after supporting him in his earlier works in Trends of Jewish Mysticism. But are, is there a place where somebody could read a biography just of Zalman Shakin? Uh, yes, there actually is. It's called The Patron, A Life of Salman Shakin, and it's by Anthony David. Uh, it's not a thousand percent correct, um, but it's, it, it gives a very interesting it gives a very interesting biographical portrait of Schocken. There are now works in um, German that are being published by him. Um, they keep sending them to me, which I'm very flattered, but I can't read them. Uh, <laughs> a, a recent one was a Salman Schocken Topographian Ein Leben by Stephanie Maurer, M-A-H-R-E-R. -E so whoever reads German, um, this is supposed to be quite extraordinary. It's by a publisher called Neo. Felis, um, which I've never heard of, um, but it's it is it's a fast it's I'm told it's a fascinating book. Um, there was also published uh, a couple of years ago the result of a of a of a uh, um, a scholarly uh, uh, commemoration of Salman Schock, and uh, this happened in Chemnitz in Germany. I was a participant. There were twenty some odd. Uh, scholarly papers delivered about the various aspects of the life of Salman Schocken. Uh, I gave one of the papers. I gave the paper about uh, Schocken in New York. Uh, but there were scholars who gave papers about Schocken books in Germany, about Salman Schocken, the department store magnet, Salman Schocken, the bibliophile. He had he has a world famous library, which is now in Israel. Um, uh, Salman Shakin, um, uh, the philosopher. Um, that's an extraordinary book as well. It's also, it was published in Germany. The papers were published in the languages in which they were delivered. 
Um, but uh, I don't have the exact title of that. I can find it. But that's uh, uh, um, I was at the conference, and, and those papers were absolutely fascinating. They provided simultaneous translation of the papers that were given in, in, in German, and it was thoroughly it was a thoroughly fascinating uh it was actually held in one of salman shakin's department stores as i said he well he at one wow. point in time in germany had 17 department stores uh, of course they were all closed down by the nazis when the war started and they met various fates um some of them like the one i believe in dresden was just bombed out of existence um by the allies during the war and then there were others that were turned into factories when uh, the Soviet Union occupied East Germany. Um, so they took those department stores and turned them into warehouses or storage or whatever. And then there were some that just lay fallow. And what the German, with the unification of Germany, what the German government is doing now is rehabilitating as many of those department stores as they can find. So the... Um, convention that I attended was held in one of these rehabilitated department stores in Chemnitz um, that is now an archaeological museum that it, it sits the Schocken Museum um, of or, or architecture, I'm sorry, of architecture. And it was just quite an extraordinary, it was the dedication of the, of the museum, um, the refurbishment of the building. It was quite extraordinary experience and sponsored by the German government. So that was really cool. Wow. Wow. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, I always ask you, you know, who, who, who runs, Sh who is shocking now? And you always say, it's me. I, I am shocking right now. It's uh, you kind of r r run the show. I know you don't appreciate these superlatives. Was there a specific perspective of Judaism that shocking was designed to highlight? I Meaning he, he published, you know, his books on Kafka, which is not maybe overtly Jewish, but, you know, has definitely been embraced in Kafka's own Judaism, and particularly his books on, on from Gershom Sholem, bringing Kabbalistic mysticism to an English-speaking audience was absolutely fascinating. Was there a specific emphasis or almost like a type of Judaism that he was trying to highlight? He was he was a, a, a Judaic polymath. He was interested in anything and everything having to do with the Jewish experience. Um, he published books by Heine. Um, he published books about Palestine in the 1930s. There was not one area of the Jewish experience that he was not interested in. He published um, Sholem Aleichem uh, uh, inside Kastrilevka. Uh, he was just he was interested in 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 every aspect of of the Jewish experience, fiction, nonfiction, um, art. Uh, artwork. Uh, his his mandate was anything that that uh, taught people about the 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 extraordinary vitality and value of the Jewish cultural experience, and to an extent, the Jewish religious experience in all of its many aspects. I'm curious, you know, what makes you unique as opposed to a lot of other Jewish publishers, particularly in the United States, is that. You have a long history comparative to the other Jewish publishers. And I'm curious if, you know, aside from being a book publisher, are you also kind of like a museum curator? Is there any of that history that still lives on in your office, in your files? Do you have access to correspondence or, or ideas in the original pen of Gershom Sholem or, or Zalman Shakin or some of the authors, Kafka? I mean, these were titans of Jewish literature, uh, or literature, you know, I don't want the listeners to come out and yell at me uh, how to classify Kafka, the Jewish literature, or just uh, literature. But certainly, he, he was corresponding and had relationships with the estates and the individuals, the, these real titans. Does any of this still live on physically, you know, in your office, in your life? Yeah, I have one very cool box of all this stuff. And there's a, a, some fellow who's doing a PhD thesis, actually, on Schocken. And he came here once to do a deep dive in my files. And a lot of it is in German, so I don't understand what it says. But he was just sitting there convulsing over all the stuff that he was reading. <laughs> and he's coming back, actually, on Tuesday. Uh, he, I think he came here, like, about a year or two ago, and then COVID stopped him. So he's coming back. I have, uh, I have alas, just one box of these really cool, and they're, they're mostly in interoffice there are some there's some correspondence and there are interoffice uh, uh, memos about 
the functioning of Shachan from about 1945 to 1950, when there was a slackening off. Um, uh, a, a lot of the Shachan files are in the Shachan library in Jerusalem. I don't know, uh, you know what happenstance, what fortunate happenstance um, led me to inherit this amazing box of, of, of correspondence, but I do have it. Um, and then there's some really um, cool Kafka stuff, manuscripts with uh, what looks to be um, Max Brode's um, um, handwritten emendations. And I actually have a, a Kafka scholar who, wow. uh, Ross Benjamin, who was uh, um, just about to publish a new translation of the diaries based on the German critical edition. And once he's done with that, that's in another box. He's going to go through that box and look through all of, of that stuff and see what that all is. But I'm 99% I'm sure that th these are manuscripts. I mean, all this was done after, of course, after uh, Kafka died. Um, but th there is a typewritten manuscript and it's got these little emendations in pencil. And uh, it, I mean, it's got to be Max Brot. I don't I know who else it could be. So um, that's something that wow. uh, Ross Benjamin is going to take a look at and figure out. So yeah, I have this, I have a lot of cool stuff here in the office. Okay, so you're you're a, a, a publisher slash uh, amateur archivist, museum yeah. archivist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you, uh, so fast forwarding to the historical Zalmanshakin, to the Shakin that is alive and well uh, today. Uh, m many of our listeners are probably most familiar with Shakin through the amazing books that you published uh, with Rabbi Sachs. I believe, To Heal a Fractured World, Not in God's Name, uh, Science and Torah, The Great Partnership. Uh, you did some amazing books with that. Why did, Rabbi, why did Rabbi Sachs choose? Do you have any idea why he chose Shachin specifically to publish his works? You know, some of his other works went with more, you know, specifically Jewish or Orthodox publishers. Do you have any idea why specifically Shachin uh, was well, chosen? Well, he started out publishing... Um, his work in the UK with uh, um, Hodder and Stoughton, uh, with their religion imprint. I mean, that they had a, they have an imprint that publishes religious books of all religions, um, and or actually, I guess before that, he was publishing with an even smaller publisher called Continuum. Um, and they distributed his books in the United States, and that included a uh, letter in the scroll. Um, and then as he became more of a public figure, first in the UK and then in, in throughout the world, uh, he was someone who would have traction for American readers. Uh, so his uh, agent had approached me, I think about another author, and I don't know whether what she mentioned that she also represented Rabbi Sachs or I knew that she did. And I said, well, if, if Rabbi Sachs is interested in having a larger footprint here in the United States for his, quote, you know, for, for his non sepharim I mean, I think I can uh, I can use that word and your listeners would understand what I mean by sepharim. Yes. Um, for his non sephorum work, oh, I would be very interested in, in publishing them at Shaken. And he had been published, as I said, I think by Continuum. And she arranged for me to meet with Rabbi Sachs when he came here on one of his lecture tours. And I was just in such awe of him. Uh, I don't exactly remember what I said, but it, it, I, it was just kind of like some stammering, st stumbling about how I would be honored to be his publisher. And, uh, and it worked out. So that's how I got to be his publisher because I did. I realized that there that there was an audience uh, for his books here in the United States that a publisher like Shocken, which is a division of Penguin Random House, would be able to reach more effectively than a smaller publisher based in the UK who basically just distributes his books in the United States. I'm always fascinated by your work, and I'm, I, I promise that I wasn't going to uh, to ask you a thousand and one questions because you are busier than almost anybody I know. My my final question that I wanted to ask you is, you know, no one likes to talk about their, you know, their favorites or picking their favorites. Is there a book that you were involved in publishing that you wish the audio or that you, it's like a personal favorite that you wish got more attention that you wish the public took a took a stronger look at you know rabbi Sachs, thank god uh really is is quite prolific and and was beloved and embraced in the community do you feel like there are any books that slid under the radar that you want to uh promote that you're especially either proud of, of your own work on it or you feel deserve a second look 
uh, from an audience? Well, I guess what I can say is I publish Aaron Appelfeld, and I think that his books are extraordinary, and I I wish that they had a, a larger readership, and I, we, uh, we, we scratch our heads here at Penguin Random House to try to figure out how to make that happen, but I've published now, I think, about um, five or six or seven books of uh, of, of Aaron Oppelfeld and they they sell that I mean they get great reviews and they sell sort of kind of respectfully but not as much as I'd like and and I just I, I just think he's such a marvelous writer and he has such wonderful things to say and and I wish my Aaron Oppelfeld books sold better that is absolutely fair could you just give us maybe one of the titles and just a word about what, what does he write about generally he writes mostly about the Jewish experience during the war, uh, World War II, before, during, and after. Um, and I'll, I'll just read you a list of, of, the, of the works that I've published of our own uh, since we began publishing him at Shock. And he's been with, with several publishers. And for his last, as I say, last few books, he's been w with Shock. And um, so we have published... Um, to the Edge of Sorrow, The Man Who Never Stopped Sleeping, Suddenly Love, um, Until the Dawn's Light, Blooms of Darkness, Laish, All Whom I Have Loved, The Story of a Life, The Conversion, and The Iron Tracks. And I, they're all just magnificent books. Um, and I encourage your readers to discover them. Alti, I cannot thank you enough. I'm always fascinated by the incredible, there's a certain dignity and majesty to everything that comes out from the Shockin' Library. There's, it's like an instant classic. Is there a time for our listeners, our listeners always love, like anyone loves, a good book sale. Is there a time when Shockin' Books like have like a big time, like now's the time you want to go on there and we would send it out? You could, the answer could be no, uh, but, you know, a lot of university presses do this sometimes. Is there is there a good time or just – it's always a good time to buy a book. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't really function the way that university presses with, like, an annual sale where we, like, cut all the prices. I mean, our, all of our books are for sale at Amazon, and, and they do they do really uh, significant discounts of books um, on Amazon. So uh, we just encourage our, our readers to, to find them on, on, uh, uh, on Amazon. Uh, the Shiva University book sale always takes a nice chunk of our backlist and, and, and does nice discounting. So people who are uh, uh, within the area that they can attend the, the Shiva University annual book sale, you'll find a nice chunk of our books there at discount. So that, that, that's an option for your readers. So, yeah, there, there are just absolute classics that, that – when you see them in the shock and library, like, wow, like it's not like a, you know, some, these are real classics that stand the test of time. I, my shelf is filled with, uh, with shock and classics. I sometimes even forget what's coming to the library to browse through your library is really something amazing. So Alti, thank you so, so much uh, for sharing with us a little bit of the history, the legacy of shock and books. Thank you. And, and thank you to the readers who read them and who will continue to discover them. I'm not sure what the personality of our listeners are, whether most of our listeners are kind of more art scroll personalities, shock and personalities, Corin personalities. I, I, I can distinctly see them as different types of people. And I hope in some ways that we are a blend of all three of these publishers and the incredible work each in their own way that they contribute to Jewish scholarship, Jewish ideas and really cultivating ourselves as people, which is why it's really been such a pleasure and something that I think is unique to the 1840 experience that we have these relationships. You know, we're not just a one track, you know, only it's, it's got to be Cohen, it's got to be Article, it's got to be Shock. And I think what makes this community so beautiful is that we're bringing together all three of these publishers and really recognizing their incredible contribution to Jewish scholarship. And I think inside of each of us, dwells a little bit of art scroll, a little bit of Corin, and a little bit of Shakin. So thank you so much for listening. This episode, unlike most of our episodes, Dina Emerson, our friend Dina Emerson, is on a break. So these episodes are being edited by also our dearest friend, Rob. 
it wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any episode, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You could also donate at 1840.org slash donate. It really helps us reach new listeners and continue putting out great content. You could also leave us a voicemail with feedback, questions, let us know if you're okay with it being played, or better yet, let us know if you don't want it played on the air. I'm going to assume if you leave us a voice note, you are okay with this being on the air. We've made this mistake once before, but please just let us know if you don't want it played. If you're leaving the voice note, I'm assuming you are okay with it being played unless you leave other instructions. And that voicemail number is... 917-720-5629. Once again, that's 917-720-5629. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y dot org, where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. Thank you so much for listening, and stay curious, my friends.